If you're like us, you've probably seen references to something called Munchausen's by proxy and been curious without really understanding what it is or how it may affect people. That's why we were excited to hear about the new podcast, Nobody Should Believe Me. The host, novelist Andrea Dunlop, takes an in-depth look at this subject. No one has ever done this before. She talks with people who have been affected by this condition. She even speaks with a perpetrator. We've already listened to the first two episodes, and we can tell you that Andrea doesn't dwell on the darkness. She takes great pains not to be gory or exploitative. This show has heart. It focuses on the humanity of everyone involved. And what makes this podcast extra special is that Andrea has a deeply personal connection to this subject. Someone very close to her was investigated for Munchausen by proxy. That gives the show a real emotional punch. When Andrea is listening to people tell stories about how they've been affected by this condition, she is not some uninvolved outsider. She has lived through the very same pain they have. She understands them. And through this podcast, she helps all of us understand them too. New episodes drop every Thursday. Listen and subscribe to Nobody Should Believe Me on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Content warning. This episode features discussion of violence against women and murder. It was getting close to 11 p.m. on April 11, 1967, and it was looking like another quiet night in Stanton, Virginia. Officers Curtis Horn and David Bilcock made their usual drive around the area businesses, just checking to make sure there wasn't any trouble in the Shenandoah Valley town. They passed by High's Ice Cream, and through the window noticed a man standing by the cash register. The officers didn't think much of it, and kept on driving. There was a phone booth nearby, and there was a young man inside it, apparently on a call with someone. His vehicle was nearby, parked awkwardly in the traffic lane. The man looked at the police officers as they drove by. Horn and Bocock continued their rounds, making their way up and down the sleepy streets. They didn't see anything unusual or noteworthy. And then they got a call. They needed to get back to High's Ice Cream right away. The officer sped back to the ice cream joint. They noticed the young man was still in the phone booth. From the outside, High's Ice Cream looked empty, but there was a man sitting in a car in the lot. He exited his vehicle very slowly. I believe, he told the officers, they have been shot. The officers raced into the shop, past the front section, and into the back room. That's when they saw the women. Constance Heavener, 19, and Carolyn Perry, 20. The two sisters-in-law worked together at High's, which was managed by Connie's mother. It was Carolyn's first job, but Connie had previously worked at a coat factory. The two had become family after Connie married Carolyn's brother, Larry. And that family was growing. Connie had recently begun to believe she might be pregnant. Now, the two women lay in puddles of their own blood. One of the girls was on her back, and the other on her side, with one of her arms partially resting in a mop bucket. The women had each been shot in the head, perhaps while preparing to take the day's receipts to deposit at the bank. Horn frantically checked the women for a pulse, and discovered that they were both still alive. The officers quickly summoned medical help for the girls, but it would get there too late for Connie. She died at the scene. Carolyn, though, was rushed to King's Daughter Hospital. Meanwhile, the officers went outside and were soon approached by the man they had noticed standing in the phone booth. He told the police that he may have seen something. What the detectives did not know was that a little more than six months later, they would be arresting this star witness and charging him with murder. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenley. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders, a 1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. 
Now we're looking to track restaurant homicides. To help us understand the patterns of these crimes, we created a spreadsheet of nearly a thousand eatery-related killings, the murder sheet. We'll be drawing on that data throughout season one to give you a deep dive into undercovered crimes. We don't just rely on skimming the headlines. We dive into these cases to bring you in-depth coverage. We're the murder sheet, and this is the High's Ice Cream Homicides, part one. As soon as Danny Perry heard what had happened to his wife, Carolyn, he rushed to King's Daughter Hospital to be with her. When he got there, he saw her and got the impression she was trying to tell him something, but he couldn't understand what. The doctors decided they wanted to transfer her to the University of Virginia Hospital. Danny, naturally, wanted to get into the ambulance and ride with Carolyn to the other hospital but they wouldn't let him do it. He told them she was trying to communicate something to him, but they didn't seem to care. They let Danny know that you couldn't put much stock in anything Carolyn said because of her injuries, and then they closed the ambulance doors and drove off. Carolyn died en route to the University of Virginia Hospital. Danny felt certain that if he had been permitted to join her in the ambulance, she would have told him who had shot her. With both victims dead, about the only way the police could hope to solve the crime was by uncovering a good witness. After all, this was 1967. Modern-day forensic science had yet to become a widespread and robust investigatory tool, and cameras installed in little shops like High's were decades away. So, at least for a while, Horn and Bocock thought that the man they saw in the phone booth might be just the witness they were looking for. His name was William Thomas Jr. He was a teacher at a nearby school. When he approached Horn and Bocock at the crime scene, he had quite a story to tell. A short time before, he'd been leaving his nearby house and remembered being struck by the stillness of the quiet Virginia night. But that silence had been shattered by a noise. Thomas thought it almost sounded as if someone had dropped a hubcap. In the distance, he could hear the sound of hurried footsteps. Thomas got into his vehicle and started driving. Suddenly, he saw two men, one white and the other black, appear in front of his headlights. The black man stood about six feet tall and carried something in his hand that looked like a pipe. The white man was larger than the other man, and wore what could have been a blue sweater. At this point, the pair separated, running off in different directions. The black man disappeared somewhere between two houses. The white man stumbled into a ditch, but then got up and ran through a vacant lot that led towards a monastery. Thomas, meanwhile, drove to a phone booth just down the street from High's Ice Cream. He went there to make a collect call to his father, and he didn't notice anything unusual while he was in the phone booth. Police took Thomas's story seriously and used police dogs to search the area for any sign of the mysterious duo he claimed to have seen. But they didn't have any luck. Perhaps it was because news of the shooting caused a crowd of morbidly curious onlookers to gather, which made a search difficult. Or maybe it was because the men didn't really exist. Police did, however, uncover one interesting piece of evidence that night. In the phone booth where Thomas had made his call, police found a coin with blood on it. Let's take a quick break from the murder sheet to tell you about a podcast investigating yet another unforgettable crime. 
The Orange Tree is a seven-part series about a 2005 homicide that happened near the University of Texas at Austin. The murder of 21-year-old Jennifer Cave, who was shot, dismembered, and left in a bathtub at her friend Colton Petoniak's apartment, continues to haunt the area to this day. Like the Burger Chef murders, this case features plenty of twists and turns, including Colton's flight to Mexico with another UT student, Laura Hall. Both were later convicted in connection with the crime, although Colton has continued to appeal his verdict and claim innocence. The business student turned convicted murderer now says that he doesn't even remember much about the night Jennifer died. The Orange Tree is reported on and produced by Haley Butler and Tanu Thomas, who were both seniors at the University of Texas when they started this project. Together, Haley and Tanu strive to piece together this tragic story in an in-depth podcast that features audio from courtroom scenes and interrogation rooms, prison phone calls, and exclusive interviews with both the perpetrators and the victim's family. You can binge all seven episodes of The Orange Tree today on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And now, back to the murder sheet. Police thought that if they figured out why the crime happened, then they might be able to solve the mystery of who had done it. Well, the victims had been preparing the day's receipts when they were gunned down, and some, although not all, of that money was missing. So it was natural to assume the motive had been robbery. But only around $150 had been stolen. Perhaps it was a more innocent time, but investigators couldn't quite accept that anyone would take the lives of two young girls simply to steal such a piddling amount of money. They told themselves there had to be something more. Could it have been a sexually motivated crime? Well, Carolyn's autopsy showed she had recently had sex before her death. Both Carolyn and Connie were young and attractive. There were reports that a group of boys had been tossed out of the shop in recent days. Perhaps a couple of them were interested in something more than a customer-cashier relationship with Carolyn. Perhaps they assaulted her. Or perhaps Carolyn had had an affair with a man that had gone disastrously bad, leading to the murders. But Carolyn's husband, Danny, said he had had sex with his wife several times in the 24 hours before the murders. And he had complete faith in her character. He knew she wasn't cheating on him. So they returned to the robbery theory, and even possibly found some support for it. Sometime after closing on June 11th, 1967, a person smashed through the plate glass door of the High's Ice Cream Shop and stole about $250 that had been hidden in a secret place. Police publicly speculated that this robbery could have been linked to the double murder. Yet they found no evidence to support that notion, and eventually the possibility seemed to wither away and be forgotten. With no other options, the police went back to square one. William Thomas Jr. Since the night of the murders, Thomas's story had grown a bit more complicated. After talking to Horn and Bocock at the murder scene, Thomas went home, not even realizing, he claimed, that a double murder had occurred. He soon fell asleep. When he woke up, he had a feeling something had happened. Strange as it seems, he told investigators, I knew it. It was about 1 a.m., Thomas stepped outside and spotted a white youth with long hair carrying a newspaper. It was only then, Thomas said, that he learned about the murders. Quite upset, Thomas went on another drive. In what sounds like something out of a fever dream, he said he soon spotted a dark border collie running loose, carrying a pair of bloody pants. Thomas stopped his car at once and tried, and failed, to capture the dog or even to retrieve the pants. This story seemed bizarre and difficult for the police to credit. Things took another odd turn when Thomas admitted he had flat out lied about seeing the two men fleeing that night. There was no white man running, no black man running. Thomas hadn't seen a thing. 
The only part of his story that was true, he said, was that he actually had been struck by how quiet it had been that night. Police, naturally, couldn't help but wonder why Thomas had made up such a story. Was it because he was a thrill-seeker who enjoyed the attention of being the key witness to a double murder? Or was it because he was himself the guilty man and wanted to give the police some ghosts to chase after? Police began to take a harder look at Thomas, and what they found tantalized them. Any normal person, wrote an officer in his notes, wouldn't do and state what this person has done. Bocock, one of the lead investigators on the case, began to believe that Thomas was actually schizophrenic. And it seemed like a real possibility. Thomas told the police he sometimes had periods of blank space. He also admitted he could, on occasion, have difficulty realizing where he actually was. Once, for instance, he thought he was playing a ball game outside, but it turned out he was actually sitting comfortably in his own living room. Thomas also had a temper. His wife at the time said he was volatile and had sometimes gotten physical with her. At least one time, he threw her on the bed and tried to choke her and his anger issues may have caused him some professional problems as well. He was employed by the Augusta County Schools for just a single year. His wife said the reason his contract was not renewed was because he had hit a student. Thomas had more pedestrian issues as well, readily admitting that he enjoyed deceiving people. He said he was a habitual liar in large part simply because he found ordinary life extremely boring. For some reason, Thomas confided even far more personal concerns to the police. He let them know he was not very satisfied with his sex life with his wife and shared with them details of his masturbation habits. Apparently, for instance, he sometimes used it as a tool to escape frustration and had engaged in that activity within a month of the murders. It seems bizarre to us that he would share this sort of information with the police or even that they would ask him about it in the first place. The investigation seemed to be going to some truly odd places. But all of this was going on behind the scenes. The public, and even the family members of the victims, had no idea what was happening in the case, and they didn't appreciate that. They sent a letter airing their thoughts to the local paper. Anya will read an excerpt from that letter now. On April 11, 1967, our wives and daughters were murdered at High's Ice Cream Store by persons unknown. To our knowledge, there have been no arrests or near arrests, and all the information we receive is from Commonwealth's attorney T.C. Elder through our daily paper, which states two of the police department are working on the case. This case is getting too old for nothing to be done. The store has been robbed again, with police not knowing about it until someone had to call them the next morning. What are they waiting on? For someone else to be killed? We think it's high time officers be put on this case. It seems to us there is very little being done. For any results, we hope and pray the citizens of this city will get behind this very serious case before it happens again, for it could just be some of their loved ones. Elder and the police chief, J.M. Boyers, did not much like the idea that they weren't doing good work on the murders. They began putting the pressure on their officers to prove the critics wrong and wrap the case up. The officers working the case, David Bocock and Floyd Jarvis, remained focused largely on Thomas. And the case against him appeared to be getting stronger and stronger. At one point, for instance... Two men who worked for Thomas's father claimed they overheard the younger Thomas confess to his father the day after the crime. It sounded promising at first, but of course, like virtually all the case against Thomas, it flowed from the suspect's own lips. Without any proof, anything Thomas said was basically just a story. The police needed something more. They did, of course, have some evidence against Thomas that involved more than just words he had told someone. 
but much of that evidence failed to stand up to scrutiny. Do you remember the bloody coin that was recovered from the phone booth? There is in the police files a note that the FBI tested a five-cent piece for blood and didn't find anything. So even that bit of evidence seemed to fall away. But the people in charge continued to press for an arrest in the case. And Thomas was, at this point, the closest thing police had to a viable suspect. So even though Bocock didn't think the case against Thomas was ready, the powers that be decided to press charges against him. In October 1967, about six months after the murders, the police drove to Thomas's house. The officers asked him to step outside to their car to talk. When, they, when he did, they let him know that they had a warrant for his arrest. It is important to note, though, that Thomas was arrested only for the murder of Connie Hevener and not Carolyn Perry. This was likely a strategic move. Due to double jeopardy, a person cannot be tried for a crime if he has previously been acquitted of it. So, if Thomas was charged with both murders and exonerated, the state could not retry him, even if they came across incontrovertible evidence of his guilt. But if they charged him with just one of the murders and he was acquitted, they would have the option of later charging him with the second murder. When he found out he was being arrested, Thomas cursed, telling the police they'd been misled and misinformed. But if that was the case, it was Thomas who had misinformed them. And it seemed like Thomas had another complaint. When they got to the police station, he looked around and asked where the reporters were. He said he'd expected the police to make a bigger deal of this. Thomas maintained his innocence while also seeming to understand the point of view of local law enforcement. He said the police were wrong about this, but not dead wrong, because I gave you every reason to suspect me. Still, he insisted, I didn't shoot those women. He was brought to trial about a year after the murders. One witness testified that she had seen Thomas inside the ice cream shop around 10 p.m. eating a banana split. If he was in there that time, it certainly made it seem plausible that he could have been the killer. But of course, even if the testimony was true, it did not come close to meeting the prosecution's burden of proving Thomas's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And so, on April 11, 1968, a year to the day after the murders, the jury found Thomas not guilty of murdering Connie Hevener. Thomas was a free man, but not out of legal jeopardy. The police still suspected he bore responsibility for the murders, and the department would keep investigating him. If and when they found convincing proof of his guilt, they could always charge him with the murder of Carolyn Perry. It would take over 40 years, but the police with the help of a local hardware store owner, would eventually discover the crucial evidence that would finally close this case. It's a twisty story about police corruption and forbidden sex, and we'll tell you all about it next week. For this episode, the primary source for our reporting was indeed a primary source, pages and pages of police files on the case. Thank you to the Stanton Police Department for passing on this extensive collection of records. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet and on Facebook at MSheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to The Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>